Hello and welcome to Designing the Future of Financial Services. So to the uninitiated, it might seem that traditional financial services and design aren't natural bedfellows. But today we're going to hear from a diverse group of financial brands about how they are each using design strategically to de-risk ideas, to drive innovation, and importantly, to help them find the right customer problems to solve. So I'm Mike Miller. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel today. I'm a consultant here at Invica, and I work with lots of organizations, helping them to gain in-depth understandings of their customers and then design digital and mobile products and services for their ever-changing needs. So I'm really fortunate to be joined today by three design leaders. And I'd like to start by asking our panelists to introduce themselves, their organizations, their areas of financial services, and importantly, what role their design team plays within their wider organizations. So can I start with you, Gabriella? Hi, everybody. I'm um, Gabriella Bello. I'm the Digital Creative Lead at DNG. I manage the in-house team of UX designers, UI designers, the copywriter and content management. Um, DNG is an insurance company um, that specializes on um, in domestic appliances. Um, we work with um, large manufacturers and retailers around the UK and the um, internationally as well. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. much. Thanks. Yeah. Now to you, Andres. Good morning all. Yep. I'm VP of Design for Visa Europe, and I lead the pan-European design teams, both on the reactive client side, helping the business win business, and the proactive product design side, which is helping the business improve better their current and existing products and also help them with new product development. We have hubs here in London and Berlin, and pretty much we're here to make the most awesome payment experiences out there. Cool. Thanks. And you, Don. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Don Trugartha, and I'm the UX design manager at Schroders. Um, we are a global asset manager, and we are, have offices in many countries around the world, but we have technology and development hubs in London, New York, and Singapore. So what we do as an asset manager is to generate and manage investments on behalf of uh, institutions, pension funds, local authorities, charities, and even private investors. And we're looking to generate income and growth for those people. We have about 500 billion pounds under management. And as a business, we've been going for 214 years. And we've seen in that time, lots of change, two world wars, a depression, financial crashes. So we've had to learn to adapt to the current market conditions. And, you know, change is part of our, our everyday life. Uh, my team size is 11, and we cover everything from uh, UX design, uh, visual design, uh, we do some service design and research with uh, our users and our uh, stakeholders. Lovely. Thanks so much. So clearly we're in good company. And given today's theme, which is experience transformation, um, let's kick things off by exploring the idea of design-driven transformation. What role is design playing for your businesses strategically? And does that role need to change or grow in any way? Um, let's go to you, Andres, from your perspective at Visa. Great. I think, you know, design is now, as in the words of Mauro Porcini, it's now holistic awareness. It's now everywhere. It's seen from the C-suite all the way down as something extremely important. The experience now comes first. This was seen just a couple of weeks ago at the payments forum where we just heard all our great leaders just say and talk about the benefits and the wonders of what design does. And especially in a time we're in now where in the pandemic, digital experiences are first and foremost, you know, this is a really good situation to be in. So I could say it's, it's now accepted, like I said, holistic awareness. And now we're thinking what's next. Sure. Gabriella, as an insurer, well, what, what strategic role is design playing for DNG? Yeah, no, we are definitely in a very exciting time. Um, it's, um, it's definitely a sort of our focus is to make sure that we are responding rapidly to what customer, customers need from us. Mm -hmm. But it's also kind of, we are trying to sort of be efficient to work with the technology available and to make sure that sort of digital asset channel becomes 
uh, part of the uh, you know of the full cycle of service design. Um, so yeah, it's, it's 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 definitely sort of an interesting position to be, and um, it's a critical role I think for the company and for us. Good stuff, Don. Any differences in the world of uh, asset management? Uh, well, design itself is something that decides what we build and when we build it. I mean, we map the customer journey from end to end and decide how we uh, inf influence and improve those touch points. We have to do this because, you know, as a, an active manager of, of uh, assets, we need to, you know, we're facing as an industry some headwinds, uh, not least from uh, passive investors, you know, simple algorithmically based uh, tracker investments. Uh, we've also got challenging markets, uh, you know, trade wars, all sorts of things going on. People's incomes are being uh, uh, put under pressure um, and also increasing customer expectations. You know, the challenger banks have done quite a lot to lift the, the bar on our, our industry and we have to meet that. Sure. So what are some of the differences in behaviours maybe that you're seeing and preferences across different audiences? Andres, as a, as a, as, or from Visa's perspective. Absolutely. Um, you know, before the actual pandemic, we were already tracking what was what we call money maps. Um, a good part of the team were looking into this and understanding how that flows. And we found some really interesting patterns, especially with the Gen Zs and the millennials. And this has been more amplified now um, with the pandemic. And it's that there is no more loyalty. Um, we would see and we would track the way their money went and they would all have a main bank account, then they would have a daily bank account, then they would have a travel bank account, and they would flick their money between this, and they would use it accordingly, depending on what their situation was. So, of course, before, if we look back, it was a time of you had one bank and you did it all. Now you have a slew of banks which adjust to that everyday situation. Mm -hmm. So super interesting. And the pandemic's only just amplified that. Sure, sure. Don, you, you and I spoke previously about generations rejecting the way their parents managed finances and wanting to do things their own unique way and using technology being really important in that. Yeah. Any thoughts from, from or further thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, you know, because we're talking about uh, at the moment some things that have happened quite, you know, in quickly and recently. Uh, but we we have in, in our tr in business an event that is, imminent it is coming in the next 25 years we call it the intergenerational transfer of assets and to put this into perspective we're, we're looking at 68 trillion dollars of assets uh, when you bear in mind that the total gro gross world product is 80 trillion dollars you know it's a sizable amount of money that's going to shift between one generation and the next and most studies suggest that 80 percent of beneficiaries of uh, an asset transfer will move their provider so wow. that's going to be a challenge and we know that these people are of necessity going to be a, of a younger generation and they're going to need different things you know, their expectations are for it to be mobile to be very transparent and interactive they want to know where they are where they stand here and now and we have to rise to that challenge. Interesting. So in light of that, Gabriella, you mentioned trust. And um, Don, you've mentioned transparency. I think that leads quite nicely into one of the overarching topics we've got today, which is UX ethics. It's a really important conversation within financial services, obviously a heavily regulated sector. It'd be really good if we could explore how um, your organizations can balance the need for, say, easy onboarding and ease of use across digital touch points, as you mentioned, Don, looking at mobile, looking at portals, looking at web, but the need to be ethical, transparent, accessible, and supportive, importantly, of financial literacy. So, Andres, from a payments perspective, any, any thoughts around this? Yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> it's, very, it's a very delicate subject. Um, because you're always playing that game. You want the engagement, you want the use that you want them to use your payment flows. But at the same time, you've got to be very careful. You don't want them to be too addictive or too gamified. Sure. And I say, I bring up these two because just recently, just before summer, there was the now the known case of Robin Hood, which is a stock app, which is pretty much verging on onto a gambling side. Yeah, it's exactly. attracting a lot of young people. 
Um, and there was that sad, unfortunate case of a 20 year old Alex Kearns that took his life Terrible. because all of a sudden he found himself $700,000 under. Now, the questions here are how did someone so young get, you know, the opportunity to go so deep mm -hmm. and why were they promoting it in a gamified way? You know, so I think now it's we're looking at that as a, an inflection point saying, OK, we've always had the first three questions which is, you know, what are we building, who for and how do we succeed? But now we're, we're asking the fourth question, which is how do we ensure what we do build or what we do make is not going to harm anyone now or in the future? Um, so it's an important question and it's now coming up in the conversation, which is, is the first step to many, but it's, it's being aware of that. Yeah, I suppose it's a growth of an understanding of that you, payments, payments businesses in general, the financial organizations have a duty of care over their customers, over their Absolutely. end. Absolutely. So Gabriella, as an, as an insurer, slightly different approach, but as an insurer, how are you seeing this? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, as an insurer and in our design processes, right? Like kind of we've, well, obviously regulated and, and that is sort of, uh, you know, the main responsibility and sort of something that you, that we're all sort of taking, take on board. And it's sort of within our design process, it's very, very important to sort of make sure that all those bases are covered mm -hmm. and go beyond that as well, sort of, and keep on asking what ifs, keep on uh, making, making sure that, you know, the content is clear, making sure that it's definitely, we are, <clears throat> sorry, taking sort of all the boxes in terms of, hierarchy and how we're presenting the information and whether you know again and Don mentioned that you know is accessible throughout the devices can you all see it sort of properly sort of accessibility is, a, is a definitely sort of a big part of what we are trying to sort of incorporate and do more and more and more and that's obviously um, a huge part on this and uh, yeah so it's sort of uh, making sure that you are definitely sort of asking these questions and being very kind of hard on the on the products that you're launching and kind of in the and the designs that you're sort of uh, publishing right and sort of in, in or or working on because um yeah the the questions are there I think we all know that the um, there there's really kind of um you know again transparency clarity accessibility is all, only gonna sort of work better it's only gonna sort of bring positive results. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, yeah, it sort of um, it, it helps raise the bar, sort of for sure. It's really interesting you mentioned that mm -hmm. because the whole approach of the millennials and Generation Z, making sure the brands that they use align with their personal values, so trust, yeah. transparency, clarity, all of those things will align with certain customers. I suppose it's trying to evaluate which values can can you appeal to, and actually can you match and meet, not just tick a box. No, totally, exactly. Yeah, it definitely makes it work a lot more solid, a lot more enjoyable, sort of, it's going to have sort of an amplified impact, sort of, you know, like, sort of, if, if um, yeah, if, if that's the approach you take from this, from the get-go, I think. Sure. sure, thanks for that. Don, ethical investment, talk to us. Well, you know, all of us, um, you know, especially younger generations, but even, you um, those of us with a few more years under our belt are actually changing our view about how we uh, live on the, on, on the planet. You know, we're all starting to get more engaged in environmental issues, you know, changing our lifestyles, diets, reducing our consumption of things like plastics, uh, not traveling as much, uh, reusing and recycling. So why can't we have pension products or savings products that that have the same ethical standards mm -hmm. and you know that is going to be something that is a big game changer in, in investments because why would you invest in something uh, that's heavily into say for instance fossil fuels coal if uh, legislation and government uh, uh, practice or um, you know new ways of living start to make that um a kind of peripheral activity, something that we don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. Why would you have a lot of investment in that that area? Why not invest in the good side? You know, because that's where we'll generate the income and that's where we'll generate the growth. You know, it is going to happen. The thing is, we need to identify to our users what it is that we are invested in, and we are we take a lot of time to explain how we are investing, how we get engaged with a business will actually 
become an active owner of a business as well. You know, take helping them make decisions about environmental issues and improve outcomes for everybody. Super, really interesting. So that leads me nicely into my next question around research strategy. So Gabriella, you and I were chatting previously about the importance of research and insights in the insurance industry. Um, but more importantly about its role in shaping business strategy, not just digital strategy for domestic in general. So can you share a little bit about how you're getting close to your customers to draw out some of those, those insights? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, obviously from, from, a, from our team perspective, we definitely don't work in isolation and we, we're very lucky to have uh, loads of other departments and teams that help us gather all these insights. Um, we work with the contact center teams, we work with the inside teams, the customer journey teams, and we draw um, quite a lot from what they have been doing, same with the, um, the service team as well, and what the feedback that they get every day from our customers, mm -hmm. that comes straight to us and we go straight to them as well, mm -hmm. uh, looking for those answers. Um, the way that we, we then sort of get to sort of review and or, or incorporate all of those results into our products is obviously more using um we will we we do remote testing mm -hmm. um we do obviously sort of yeah again work with uh, moderator testers and moderators and sort of uh, going through that um prototypes that we might have and then you know ways to find out sort of what the um yeah the 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 the, the issues that we need to resolve before we go to death um we um yeah, sort of mostly it's around sort of surveys, what we get from, from those teams, um, what we do sort of on the labs, what we do sort of on remote testing. Those are the, the tools that we, that, we, that we use usually, but definitely we need to test. Um, there's no UX without testing. Sure. Um, we are, you know, there's definitely something that you need to sort of put out there and make sure that you are keep on asking the what ifs and the yes ands and keep on sort of, um, yeah, really sort of, iterate on those designs to make sure that what you are coming up with um, solves bigger problems and has a lot of impact. Lovely. I really like that top or that um, point you made at the start, um, Andres, about holistic awareness. It's Gabrielle, you've just talked about all these business units in your organization and having that real awareness of what of how they're all working together and how ultimately they impact the customer. It's really important. Absolutely. Don, from a, from a perspective as an asset manager, how, how are you seeing and how are you drawing out insights from, from some of your customers? Well, obviously, as I've said before, the customer isn't always the person that we deal with directly. So we deal with through intermediaries, but we do have ways of tracking what uh, our uh, customers uh, are, are thinking about us. We're quite um, recently started doing quite a lot of intercept surveys um, on some of our platforms and we're able to start mapping sentiment against uh, the regular analytics that we're gathering mm -hmm. and starting to draw some correlations and some, um, some findings from those. We're also doing lots of um, remote testing, uh, you know, moderated and unmoderated. I think the issue with we have with testing is that finding and recruiting the correct um, it, you know the client types is is quite a challenge yeah. because sometimes you'll need uh, some something like a uh, a local authority um, pension trustee. There aren't that many of them and you probably could find them all in a, a telephone book. So to try and find you know um, people you can test and discuss uh, a, a product with uh, is um, can be quite difficult. Again, some people are high net worth individuals who, uh, to give them the usual Amazon fifty pounds <laughs> voucher, is neither here nor there for an in-depth <laughs> diary study. Yeah, I, I can see a lot of them lining up for that. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks, um, Andres. Yeah, I think, you know, um, you know, as a design function, you know, research is fundamental, it's core, it's everywhere. Um, we will chew on anything, um, be it data insights, be it talking to customers, be it talking to business units. It really is everywhere for us. You know, you really, it's not a, a means of finding out what to do, but a means of understanding what the problem is. It's a really, it's a good way of really getting into the nitty gritty and getting granular. Okay, what is the real issue here? 
and sometimes you get those surprises. So, you know, we're really lucky. We have a data insights team. We have a visa analytics and consulting team, which do a, a slew of great work as well. So, you know, we're, we're, we're pulling anything from anywhere. Um, and the, the mantra is, is there's never enough research ever. Yeah. Um, so you can just go on and on and on. And, you know, as far as we can, we will. Excellent. So I'm conscious of time. We do have one last question, and this is fairly broad and it's something you mentioned and brushed off earlier, Don. So banking is obviously just one area of financial services. I think everyone is interested in thoughts around the challenger banks. They seem to have built their successes on the idea that they offer the best UX in banking. But what can that offer to other financial services? What, what, can, what can FS brands learn from the challengers? Just interested to hear some of your opinions. Uh, Don. Well, I think we can learn quite a lot. Uh, I mean, the actual, I think one of the things that really strikes me about it is the, the need uh, to gather just enough information to make the transaction both legal and valid. Uh, far too many people will ask questions just for the sake of asking questions and rather, rather than being informed about the actual thing that they're needing to deliver. So, you know, what we call in a, a industry acronym, acronym KYC, know your customer, is something that, you know, is done in, in minutes within a, a challenger bank application. For us, it might take months, you know, and, you know, there is obviously a delta there that we can close, you know, we have to close, otherwise, you know, the experience will suffer. Sure, interesting. How about you, Gabriella? Yeah, I think from a from 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 my perspective, from a practical perspective, in terms of um, you know designing, what has been sort of incredibly important and in, in, in as an industry is just the, the way to approach the content, the mm -hmm. content design and the copywriting of all of it. I mean, I think they have proven to be, you know, that you can say things with plain English and you can say things in a very sort of in a friendlier way. In a sort of yeah. that, I think that has been. Um, you know, really important as an industry and obviously the technology, right? Like they're kind of, you know, how, how quickly and how, how well they're using uh, the devices and, and the, um, you know, the capabilities that those devices have in order to sort of identify you as a person and again, go through the huddles quite quickly and remotely. Yeah. Andres, I love the point you made earlier. Um, and when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned around dynamic products and around just giving people what they need when they need it. Any, any more thoughts specifically relating to how the challenger banks seem to be ticking those boxes for people? Exactly. I think, you know, it's the mindset they have, you know, being that startup mindset, they focus on little things and they play the one up process, which is they focus on one thing, they get it right, and then they move on to the next. And they, gradually building up if you look at revolut for instance you know you look a couple of years ago it was basically just a cross-border tool you know it allowed you to flick between different currencies and that was it but they've been slowly nailing you know functionality after functionality and they're, they're extremely focused and if you look at the big player banks you know the, the traditional banks they're always about let's get everything and do everything rather than getting that focus point mm -hmm. and to my point before with the money maps um Customers now, they, they know what they want and they want tools that fix certain problems. And that's all they're interested in. They don't, they're not bothered anymore about having it all in one. So it's really interesting times of how they're doing it. It's also interesting seeing how the challenges are now growing as well. And now they are leaving that specialized niche and becoming more, you know, more broad in services. So I think there's an inflection point, but it's, you know, it's definitely a good time to be in. Sure. Thanks for that. So I think we have just about enough time. Um, I have one last question. I'd love to know um, if you could share some final remarks around the future of financial services, our topic. Why design is so key to that future? Um, to you, Don. Design, uh, yeah, I mean, if we don't look at our products and services through the lens of a, the design process, we're going to get it massively wrong. I mean, at, at the end of the day, we are, we are work designing and working for our customers. And if we can't deliver a decent customer experience, then, you know, there are lots of competitors that are going to be snapping at our, our heels 
you know, uh, our in the asset management has very few challenges as such, mm-hmm. but they'll come. Yeah. And we need to be ahead of them. You know, if we if they're going to do something, we need to do it twice as twice as good. Sure. Gabriella, quickly. Um, sure. Yeah, I think I mean, definitely. I, I, I think we are going to keep on growing and they you need to keep on adapting. That's for sure. Um, and diversifying and obviously, yeah, um, answering to technology. And I think designers of function will also need to be adapting to new technologies, to automation, to, um, you know, making sure that sort of that technology is embedded into the process as well. Um, and um, yeah, it's definitely sort of interesting times. Um, we we want we keep on sort of focusing on the craft, but also sort of focusing on making sure that it's coded real and um, and and you know a customer can sort of face sort of what what we are proposing quickly. Sure, sure. And closing, Andres, any final thoughts? I think you know for our financial sector, you know we're in in the game for the invisible payment. If you ask me what the best payment flow is, it's Uber. You just get out of the car. You it's don't do anything. It's just done. Um, and when you hear of the likes of Amazon that are already thinking about zero click shopping, you know, how can we be there? How can we really do, you know, how can we really make invisible payments a reality? And I think we've got our work cut out. Whilst being ethical about it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're out of time. I would love to spend more time on this. Um, We are, however, going to open up the floor for some questions. So firstly, thank you so much for taking the time out, giving us some of your insights. I'm sure that the audience will be really impressed with what they've heard today. Lots of food for thought. Um, We'll open up the floor to some questions and yeah, we'll come back to you shortly. Thanks, Mike. Thank Thank you you very much. Thanks so much.